mind functions in two ways. It acts and it knows. Its acting is, starts out with the thinking, and then it gets the body to act in line with its thoughts. But it's also aware of what's going on. It's because of the combination of these two things that we know anything at all, that we can understand anything at all. If we're just basically aware and sensitive but weren't able to act, the world would sort of wash over us and we wouldn't understand a thing. Or if we're just acting without being aware, it would be like just wind blowing through trees. The wind doesn't know anything. It just does its thing. But the mind is, has this special quality of being both an actor and a knower. And the problem is that in its actions it creates a lot of suffering for itself. If we don't really know, we can act in ways that cause a lot of suffering not only for ourselves but also for other people. So this is what we have to work on. We have to be aware of what we're doing so we can stop causing so much suffering. That's where the meditation comes in. The train is to be more alert to what we're doing. Then normally out in the world, where are we most alert to what we're doing? It's when we're working at a skill. Pay very close attention to what you're doing and look at the results and adjust them. And the same principle holds in the meditation. You've got to work at it as a skill. If you just simply do the steps without paying much attention to what's going on and simply hope for good results to come, it just doesn't work. You have to be alert to what you're doing, alert to what's happening as a result of what you're doing, and then make adjustments in what you do as a result. In other words, you have to develop the quality both of attention and intention at the same time. Pay attention to what you're doing. And what you're doing here is working on an intention. Our intention here is to get the mind to settle down. And so we approach it as a skill. Of course, in the beginning, as with any skill, it's like following a recipe. You follow what's in the book, and you do what you're told to do several times. And you begin to get more of an intuitive feel. This is where your alertness kicks in and your understanding of what you're doing begins to kick in. Then it becomes your meditation. Not that you're learning about Buddhism, but you're using the process of meditation to learn about yourself. So you can see in what ways that your thoughts and deeds are not skillful. Create suffering for yourself, create suffering for others, and you can make a change. Because you're not just blindly acting. You're acting with alertness. The skill here we're working on at the moment is getting the mind to get concentrated, getting it absorbed in the breath. The word for absorption in Pali is jhana, which is related to a verb which means to burn. Like a fire burns. They have several different words for burning in Pali, and it's interesting that the one they choose for jhana is the steady burning of an oil lamp. Jayati means that. It burns steadily. The flame doesn't flicker. It doesn't move around a lot. It's a very steady light. And that's the kind of quality you want to develop. So find one spot in the body where you know the breath is coming in, you know it's going out, it feels good, and then protect that spot in the same way you'd want to protect a flame from the wind so it doesn't go out, it doesn't waver. The Thai word that John Fuang uses is bakong. It's, the, it's a very gentle kind of protection. Because when you hold a baby chick in your hands, you don't squeeze it so tight that it dies. But at the same time, you don't hold it so loosely that it can fly away. Protect it just enough so it stays where you want it. If the breath doesn't feel comfortable at that spot, well, just very gently adjust it until it does. Then when you finally get a feeling tone that feels good right there, notice what other spots in the body have that same feeling tone. And think of them connecting. It's as if you're starting a fire in a wind. You, at the very beginning, you have to protect that little tiny, tiny flame you've got until your fuel catches fire. Then the whole, with the breath meditation, you begin to realize the whole body is breathing, and you can have that feeling tone throughout the body. Just let it spread.
and then let it stay there. It's a kind of a balancing act, so you don't put too much pressure on and you don't get too loose, but you've got to pay very close attention to what you're doing. And this is how discernment arises from the practice of jhana. As you're paying very close attention to what you're doing, you begin to see things, and slight movements in the mind, slight movements in the body that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. Without this point of comparison, things can move and you can hardly know whether they're moving or not, how fast, in what way. It's like lying on your back on a field and looking up at the clouds in the sky. If you don't have a reference point on the ground, you begin to lose track after a while. Which direction are those clouds going? Are they moving at all, or is it just a figment of your imagination? But if you've got something like a telephone pole or the gable of a house, something you know is standing still, then you can make comparisons. And it's the same with the mind. We want to develop this quality of stillness and steadiness. So when things do move, you, be, you notice it. And you notice the quality of the action as they move, whether it's skillful or not, what comes from it. Because insight basically means seeing cause and effect. All too often we see causes without effects or effects without causes. In other words, we see what we do, but we're not too clear on what the results are. We very definitely get results in terms of pleasure or pain, but we're not quite sure what happened, how we did it. And the mind, when the mind is in that mode, it doesn't really gain any insight at all. But when it sees the connection, oh, you do this and this results. When you do that, that results. That's insight. Because it gives you a stronger and stronger sense of what you're doing whether it's skillful or not, whether it's causing suffering or not. And you find that the mind inclines to find ways of acting that cause less and less and less suffering, that are more and more skillful. But before you can see these things, this state of steadiness has to be really steady. You have to protect it, you have to look after it, treat it with respect. One of the verses we chant in the the morning even chanting verses of respect. This one lies samati karu atabi, one who is ardent with respect for concentration. You've got to respect this quality of the mind. Have a strong sense of its importance. Even though in the beginning it may not seem like much, just this tiny little flame that you're trying to keep going, whoops, there it goes, it's blown out. Well, you light it again. You try to keep it going, whoops, there it goes, blows out. And you start wondering if anything is ever going to come of it. But after a while, you find that you can keep at least a little flame going. And when it begins to connect up through the body, you get a strong sense it really feels good. And the mind has a sense, well, it's the last it's coming back home to a place where it's been, probably been before. I didn't know how it got there, but now it's beginning to realize we can get there as a skill. There's a certain rightness to it. And then once you develop the skill again, you tend to say, well, it becomes kind of ordinary after a while. Well, it's because you've got it, but you're not putting it to the proper use. You don't see what power is it can have in making a change in the mind. But sometimes you can't push it, push it. Sometimes you have to just sit there and wait. It's like being a hunter. The hunter goes out in the forest, and they can't determine, well, the rabbits are going to come before 10 or 2 or whatever time and then we'll go home. It doesn't work that way at all. You have to go out and just sit there and wait and watch. There has to be the quality of stillness but alertness at the same time to see what's going to come up. Sometimes nothing comes up. But you can't abandon that quality of alertness, because if you do, that might be just the moment when something interesting went past in the mind. So learn how to treat your powers of concentration with respect. Because they make all the difference between understanding the mind and not being able to gain release from your stress and suffering, or just staying where you've always been all along. The Buddha said that right concentration forms the center of the path. There are eight factors altogether in the path. 
the right concentration forms the heart. All the other seven factors said are just kind of requisites to help look after concentration, give it the right balance, give it the right tone, give it the right level of alertness. But the concentration is what forms the core. So as we're working here, trying to center our minds on the breath, remind ourselves this is the core of the path that we're working on. It's a noble truth when we get it going right. So it's worth your full attention. <laughs>